this constant this constant war all the time now uh, leads me to be suspicious that our governments are really interested in peace when they send weapons i i there's too much profiteering there's been profiteering from war since the first world war why did that war go on so long look at the profits that were made that look at the profits that our big oil companies have just recently made that's basically war profiteering mark rylands for best part of a decade brian hall was impossible to avoid if you lived or worked in westminster but just remind listeners who may have forgotten the name forgotten the man forgotten his campaign who exactly he was and why he spent so long on parliament square well brian hall was a a protester for peace he 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 was a a devout christian man actually and he was horrified by the um he was horrified but really by the killing of kids that that's what really uh was the core that he he would say regularly stop killing the kids and and eventually he came to say stop killing my kids because he thought well maybe the reason people are allowing this to go on is they're not thinking of these kids as their own they're somehow thinking them as not really kids so he would say stop killing my kids um this he started before the iraq war but this was particularly brought home to him and to myself and other friends when I think it was Caroline Lucas brought back pictures from Iraq of the of the poor children, uh, newborn babies who were suffering terrible birth defects from the depleted uranium that, that the United States with our support was using to, um, you know, to try and get Iraq to do what we wanted them to do. The depleted uranium will cause birth defects in that nation, I'm told, for 50,000 years. That's a long time. I, I, I certainly, if my wife or my daughter ha had a child and and the, it had that kind of grotesque birth defect, and I knew it was from uh, a war, I, I, I would be standing up protesting too. I, I don't have the kind of persistence and courage that Brian, who was a kind of soldier, most soldiers go to fight because they believe their fighting will will enable peace. Um, he, he didn't fight, he stood 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for 10 years until he died. He stood in the end on two crutches opposite the powers that be, opposite the Houses of Parliament, stood longer than most of our prime ministers. Eh? So on that basis alone, he deserves a statue. Just saying there must be a better way of, of achieving whatever we're trying to achieve, security, safety, peace in the world. I don't know, economics, whatever thoughts are going through our governors' minds, there must be a better way than killing kids. There must be a way that doesn't involve killing kids. And, and how did you come to know, Brian? How, how did your friendship develop? Well, I was very, very, uh, I was working at The Globe when the, uh, in, on the 15th of February in 2003, there was the Great March, not only in London, across the world, I think 30 million people around the world March to try and prevent that intervention in Iraq, and and I believe there were two million because I set in London because I set off from the Globe and I got no further than Waterloo Bridge. There were so many people, and they weren't the normal protesters that I've seen, you know, uh, protesting to free Mandela or all the different protests I've seen. Wonderful protests in London over my life here. They they were people with prams, people from the Midlands, families, children. You could see from the way they were looking around. They, they couldn't believe it. They'd never been in something like this. It, it was an extraordinary expression of democracy and of, of the citizens of this nation who are fed up with don't stand for violent resolution of conflict in their bedrooms, in their workplaces, in the streets. What, why, should our, why should we be told that violence is the way to resolve conflict internationally? We don't stand for it anywhere in our society. And it felt like an expression of that. And when Tony Blair uh, ignored that, ignored the 140 MPs who also voted against uh, going into Iraq and, and, and was, was sold us all those lies about, you know, weapons of mass destruction, I was, my belief in the democracy was, uh, in our government was really struck to the core. So I started to take, then I noticed that Brian had been there for a few years and I started to stop by and see him regularly and 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 ask him what what was going on you know what these different posters and things meant and after i left the globe 
in 2005, I started to get work in the West End and I would take the bus and see him from the bus because I live in the South London. So I'd go by through Parliament Square and, and I like to ride my bicycle uh, down behind St. James and through Parliament Square. So I'd often stop after a show and give him a sandwich or give him some cash that I had in my pocket or whatever and just hear what what how he was doing. I, I just had never met any man like him. I, I just think he's one of the greatest yeah, greatest people I've met in London during my life here. This morning or the other day, you, you, the, the other day I was hearing about the terrible earthquake and hearing a story of a father holding a hand of someone in rubble, you know, and then the, the reporter on the Today program said, or said, said, the reporter said, and the hand was his daughter's hand. And, and I weep when I hear that. That's an earthquake, you know. Uh, we, that's we, an act of God. It's not a, a war, as you say. And yet, and yet that man, we, many men stand holding the hand of their children in rubble that our bombs, our weapons, our foreign policy has contributed to. Um, he, uh, we, that's the truth of, 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 of how we behave internationally. And I, I just so appreciated that Brian took that to heart and stood in the street trying to remind our governors Whatever they're trying to do, let's do it a different way than this. What do you think Brian would have thought? Obviously, we can't ask him, but you knew Brian well, and I think you've articulated his philosophy uh, very clearly and very movingly. What do you think he, his view would have been on the conflict in Ukraine, which is obviously a war of aggression by Russia against against Ukraine? Do you think he would be you know, protesting for peace on the Ukrainian side? I believe that we know peaceful resolution of conflict works and violent resolution of conflict, it, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't. It creates more, um, more victims. You know, you kill one man to stop, um, you kill one man to stop, you, you upset his sons, his wives, his families, his uncles, his friends. You, you know, it, it's not the way to do it. If someone comes into my house or attacks me in the street, yeah, I might use violence. I might pick up something to defend myself. So, so at, at a late moment like that, you, most of us are probably going to use violence to defend our, our dog or our, our family or something we love ourselves. So that's one thing. But this constant, this constant war all the time now I, leads me to be suspicious that our governments are really interested in peace when they send weapons. I, I, there's too much profiteering. There's been profiteering from war since the First World War. Why did that war go on so long? Look at the profits that were made. The, look at the profits that our big oil companies have just recently made. That's basically war profiteering. When they paid out the dividends, what was it, five billion in dividends, much less than they're putting into renewables, by the way, did they offer to their shareholders, listen, this has come because of this unfortunate conflict. If you'd like to give some part of your dividends to, to, towards peaceful resolution of conflict, here's a way we could do that. No, not at all. I, I, I think it's disgusting. I, I, it, it, it's, it's too much in it. So I, I'm not so sure. It would take a lot to convince me that sending more weapons is the way to respond to any conflict in the war. £26 billion of arms we've sold to Saudi Arabia to help them uh, resolve the war with Yemen. Those, those weapons have been used to bomb weddings, funerals, churches, schools, farms. I don't feel comfortable with that at all. I'd like us to have a, to be putting even a tiny proportion of what we spend on military defense into peaceful resolution of conflict. We've got the best language in the world, a language that's used to land airplanes all over this planet, safely land airplanes. We've got incredible skills of mediation, of counseling, psychiatric understanding, all kinds of things in this country. That's what I'd like to be sending or, I'd, or, or certainly giving a lot more support to the UN and to the international um, courtroom in The Hague and things that are collective. Here's an example. If, if there was a war like the Ukraine going on in a household in my street, uh, say a husband and wife fighting it out, would I would I would I go make a decision that I, I was going to give my revolver to the wife to help resolve that because I think she's right or to the husband? I don't think so. I think I'd call the police and we try to first of all calm it down so that the kids weren't going to get killed. 
Um, certainly I wouldn't sell them a weapon or give them a weapon that was going to possibly kill their kids. We, 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 we try and move it towards talking and resolving it peacefully as quickly as possible. Uh, I, I'm not someone who believes that throwing weapons into any fight it, it, it is, the, is the right way to, war, to move towards the peaceful resolution of that conflict. Tell us about the statue of Brian. What's it going to look like and, and where are you going to put it? Because they, you can't put it in Parliament Square where Brian's encampment was. Where is it going to go? We, Amanda Ward, a wonderful artist, made the sculpture. And um, they tried at first to get it in Parliament Square. That didn't work. Fortunately, um, a friend of mine has, runs a thing called the School of Historical Dress. And she obtained a building opposite the Imperial War Museum in Lambeth. And she has a wall on that building. That building turns out to be one of the first mental health outpatient wards, I think the first in the UK. And it was used to help soldiers after the First World War, during the First World War, who had suffered shell shock. So it's a very, very potent place to have, a, have this little statue of Brian on the wall facing the Imperial War Museum. They're very happy about it, the Imperial War Museum. We're not you know, in conflict with them. They, it's right to remember the wars. We just want to make sure that the kids going into that museum um, uh, are thinking that we remember these wars in order to do everything we can to avoid them and to resolve them peacefully in the present and in the future. You know, we don't want to keep sending our young people to go and kill other young people, 90% of which are civilians uh, in modern warfare. There's also the Tibetan Peace Garden there on the corner um, which uh, Sting and Trudy Styler and the Tibetans created when I was at the Globe, and so it, it's becoming a it's becoming a good little centre about war and peace, and a place for people to to think about whether there are better ways um, to to go about uh, behaving in the on the international stage, where where there are conflicts. There will always be conflicts, won't there? Conflicts are wonderful things. They're wonderful in drama, in music, in art. They're, they're very beautiful things, but they, they, they're to be um, held and resolved and uh, peacefully. They're usually signs of great growth and possibility, not, not something to dominate and try and win, uh, I think. So that's where he'll be. And the, the pathway from that Lambeth Road goes right to Lambeth Palace, then over the bridge to Parliament Square. So if Brian, even though he's now in bronze, ever wants to jump down and walk over and take up his protest again, it's it's a very clear path. I know you said that um, you know that, that that march in 2003, nearly uh, 20 years ago this week, was such a such an iconic moment, wasn't it? But do you, as someone who was on it, now think are you disillusioned? Do you think well, it didn't work? We were ignored. Do, do you now think sort of clearly you still believe in the power of protest because you're backing this project? But do you think all those efforts were in vain? No, I don't think it's ever in vain. For people to speak from their conscience, um, it may it may not it, it may not be enough initially to change everything. I I I I think it's been a little bit harder for the government to um, to to take us into war since that war. I know that those protests um, helped people, particularly I've heard from the Egyptians from Egyptians that it helped inspire them to try and change the um, dominating governance that they had in their nation. Um, I, I know I, I think it's very important that people, that when you feel something is wrong, that you, you say it. I think there's so many forces from commerce, from government, from school, telling us that we're, our voice is worthless, that it makes no difference, that individuals are powerless. That's very dangerous. The, the, the Nazis in Germany didn't come about just because of one evil maniac called Hitler. They came about because the conscience of the German people had somehow been subdued and frightened into not protesting when they saw the terrible things happening to their Jewish neighbors and to, to, to the nations around them. Um, it's a very, very dangerous thing for protest to be subdued and quiet. And, and it's a very dangerous thing in our own lives for us to think, well, my conscience what does it matter? I'll have no effect. That that if you think that nationally, I think that can kind of fester. And soon you could be thinking that in your workplace. Soon you can be thinking about it in your home, in your bedroom, in your child's bedroom. It it, it you know. 
uh, this terrible, sad thing we're looking at uh, of the police at the moment. The majority of the police, the police I know, do an incredible job, incredible. But you, you've got to take the, um, someone said it, you've got to take, if you've got one rotten apple in the fruit bowl, it's, it's going to affect the other apples. And it's likewise within our own soul, within our own character. If, if you've got a, a moment of conscience and you suppress it, you don't listen to it, you don't give it expression, it can it can it can foul the rest of the fruit in the fruit bowl, so to speak. You've given Mark a very, uh, Sir Mark, I should say, you've given a very uh, cogent critique and a coherent critique and a forceful critique of what what our governments do abroad and and warmongering. You know, do, have you ever grappled with the question of whether Sir Mark is something you want to be in that context? You know, because lots of people, John Lennon, Alan Cummings, recently have given up their own titles and their OBEs and their knighthoods in protest of this sort of stuff. Do you ever think that will be a powerful protest or is it something you're comfortable with? I do think about it. Um, I, 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 I think that I have some... I, I think that maybe it's a little harder for the authorities to write me off. Um, I would imagine I'm more written off by um, very ardent Republicans. But I, I think that... Um, I do think about it a lot, but I I I feel like it it's it it it's 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 a sign of citizenship really. It's a sign that I was given it for services to the theatre. What was interesting to me, you know, when I went along to the ceremony, um, those of us like me who are just celebrities, you know, notables because we're actors, we were a tiny minority. The hundreds of people who were there, I think, four hundred people there that day where the majority were nurses, doctors, teachers, normal people. It, we're just there to get our faces on the front page of the Times, you know, and for the ceremony to be remembered in society. But the majority of those awards are celebrations of humble people who are doing selfless things for the, for the nation. And in, in that way, I, th I think it's good that, it, that people are celebrated. Um, I, I have a lot of trouble with the um, military history of the con country and, and that we didn't disarm after the Second World War. We turned all our inventions in military um, armaments into a shop and we sold those arms to other people. It, it's, it's hard to be a winner of a fight, harder in some ways to be, than being defeated. Um, we, we were poor and we didn't disarm. Um, there are lots of things I disagree with, as we all disagree with things. I do. I have had the great honor of meeting our next king on a number of occasions. He is he is one of the most severe, sincere, devout lovers of Shakespeare I've ever met in my life. And I think that his record proves him to be one of the m most far seeing and intelligent uh, leaders in the world. So I'm very, very excited about um, him coming into a position of being king and that uh, in if being a sir, a knight, is a support to him, then I'm happy on that basis um, to be a knight. Uh, I don't feel it makes me better than anyone. In fact, I think people are more impressed by me having an Academy Award than being me being a knight of the realm. But um, it certainly feels like it makes me keep my feet to the fire, you know, that I've been given this honor. So like with this Brian Hoare thing, I, I should try and do things that are a benefit to society not just to myself and my friends so mark rylands it sounds like you'll be so mark for some time thanks very much for joining us on times radio thanks for your great questions and for the time i hope people will come and join us and we'll get brian up on the streets again